Amen. I'm going to ask you to join me in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, as we continue uh, this morning, our series that we called Encounters with Jesus. We were looking at the four Gospels of the New Testament and seeing how Jesus meets people in all sorts of situations, all sorts of needs, and finding that as he meets them, he also meets us. And we'll continue that in Matthew 14 this morning. But before I get to our text, I want to add two things to, to what Steve uh, said in the announcement time. First of all, as he mentioned, we would like to restart children's worship. But in order to restart children's worship, uh, we need people to do that. We need volunteers to help lead that time. And, and if you haven't been here before and don't know what we do with children's worship, this is during the sermon portion of the service. Uh, the younger kids have a time of, of teaching uh, during that time. And so we need volunteers for that. We have a great curriculum that serves our teachers well uh, in that ministry. It's a great way to serve the kids of our congregation and also so to serve the needs of the families who come and worship with us. So if you would be willing, if you have in the past and would be willing to re-up your commitment to serve in children's worship, or if you haven't in the past and would like to serve in that area, would you please contact me? You can email me or talk to me. Love to have you involved uh, in that area of our ministry. And then another of area of ministry I want to invite your help with is with worship. And I think as most of you know, we're, we're approaching a transition in leadership here at Walnut Creek. And I would love to have some help leading the liturgy of the service. I would love to involve some of you in the elements of our service, like call to worship, the confession of sin, the, the intercessory prayer, and other elements of our liturgy. I'd love to have members of our congregation involved in our service in that way. Don't worry. You don't have to write it. You don't have to create it. I'll provide uh, what you need if you're interested in helping with that. But if you contact me again, um, let me know if you'd be willing to help. I'd love to develop a list of folks who'd be able to help in that way. All right. Matthew 14. I'll begin reading in verse 22. Hear now the word of the Lord. Immediately he, that's Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the son of God. Let's pray. Father, as we now come to the words and actions of your son, help us to join the worship of his disciples. To bow before him now as we come to your word, celebrating who he is. We pray that through this time we would not only receive teaching, ideas, concepts, but we would know the presence of Christ walking among us as he walked to his disciples. And we pray it all in his name. Amen. It has often been noted that one of, if not the most repeated command in the Bible is, do not fear. Don't be afraid. And of course, we have one instance of that command 
in the text that is before us this morning. But in my own personal and pastoral experience, the command, do not fear, is not only one of the most common commands in the Bible, it is one of the most difficult commands in the Bible. I think I've mentioned this before, but several years ago, there was an article in the New York Times that showed how prescriptions for anti-anxiety meds have skyrocketed and surpassed prescriptions for antidepressants. The article says that we have become not a Prozac nation, but a Xanax nation. And that pandemic of anxiety is just out there. It's not just an issue out there. It is an issue in here. We've all been touched by it. We've all been gripped by fear. We all deal with this issue, including the pastor-elect of Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church. I know what it's like to wake up at 2 a.m., heart racing, mind spinning. I know what it is like to be caught in the vortex of what if, what if, what if, what if. I have the finely cultivated talent of doing what my counselor calls catastrophizing. That is interpreting every situation in the most disastrous way possible. And I'm not the only one am I? All of us have been touched by the pandemic of anxiety or worry or stress or straight up fear, whatever we want to call it. And if you're, if you think you're not susceptible to that, well then let me ask you about your anger because there's no anger without fear. We get angry because we feel threatened. And one of the best questions to ask of our anger is, what am I afraid of? But still, Jesus says to his disciples, and he says to us, don't be afraid. Do not fear. So what do we do with this extraordinarily difficult command? Well, I want to look at the story we read this morning, the story of Jesus encountering the fear of his disciples. And I want us to see two things, the nature of our anxiety and the possibility of our anxiety. First of all, the nature of our anxiety, and I use the word nature with pun fully intended, because part of the disciples' fear is in response to the threat of nature. They're in the middle of a storm that is a genuinely dangerous situation. And even without the wind and the waves, their location would have been deeply symbolic of danger. For most ancient peoples, the sea, large bodies of water, represented the unpredictability of life the uncontrollable forces that we all deal with, that we all encounter. Because you never know when a storm's going to come from above or what might come up from below. And that's scary. That's scary not only for ancient people. That is scary for modern people. Even with all of our safety features, there is still a frightening unpredictability to life. Last week, I was on vacation, and I was with my parents and my siblings, and I was reminded of how my dad, if any of his kids are driving, he will not go to sleep. I remember many, many times walking into the house, no matter how late it was, and seeing him sitting in his rocker, just rocking back and forth waiting for me to walk through that door safely. 
And we used to chuckle about that, like you did. And we used to tease him about that until his nightmare came true. Until he got that call in the middle of the night. My sister was driving home for Christmas, hit by a drunk driver, almost killed her. She's had so many surgeries, I've lost count. Still deals with physical lim limitations and pain from that accident. Life possesses a frightening unpredictability. And Jesus, when he says, do not be afraid, he doesn't dismiss that reality. He's not saying nothing bad will ever happen to you. Nothing's going to come up from the deep and take a bite out of you. He is not saying your life will be perfectly safe and free from harm. He's not dismissing the frightening reality, but he is teaching us to reinterpret the frightening reality. And here's what I mean by that. Did you notice that when the text first specifically mentions the fear of the disciples, it is not in response to the storm. No, it's in response to that figure who is walking towards them on the water in the middle of the night. And how do they interpret that figure? It's a ghost. And by that, they do not mean Casper the friendly ghost. They don't mean Patrick Swayze the romantic ghost. They mean it's an evil spirit from hell. It's an evil spirit from the realm of the dead. And what does Jesus do? Well, he corrects their misinterpretation. He says, no, it's not a ghost. It's me. He invites them out of their fear, not by announcing a plan to make them safe, but by announcing his presence. He says, it's not a ghost. It's me. See, here's the problem with fear. It's not that there's nothing to be afraid of. There are things to be afraid of. The problem with fear is that it takes over and it becomes the lens through which we interpret everything. What Jesus is saying when he says, do not be afraid, is, is he's saying, yes, there are threats. That's real, but that's not all that's real. That is not the entirety of your reality. And he is inviting us to the deeper reality of his presence. But why does that matter? How and why does that make a difference to our fear, to our anxiety? We'll consider, secondly, not only the nature of our anxiety, but the possibility of our anxiety. When Jesus came to his disciples on the sea, he didn't appear out of nowhere. No, he came from somewhere, right? He came from the mountain where he had been praying, where he had been communing with his father. Now, in the ancient world, if the sea represented instability, the mountain represented the opposite. And, and not only that, before Jesus was on the mountain, where was he? Well, he was in the wilderness. He was in the desolate place, miraculously feeding a large group of people. And that sequence of desert, mountain, water, deliberately echoes one of the central stories of the Bible, the story of the Exodus. Because when God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt, how did he do that? Well, he enabled them to walk through a dangerous body of water. And then he miraculously fled, fed them in a desolate place in the wilderness. And then he met them through Moses on the mountain. And then after they wandered a while in the desert, how did he lead them into the promised land? 
Well, by once again enabling them to walk through a dangerous body of water. So you see what Jesus is doing here. He is not just performing magic tricks to impress and entertain the audience. No, he is revealing who he is. He is showing the disciples and he's showing us that he is the God of that story. And he is bringing that story to this situation. Verse 27 uses the awkward phrase, it is I. And and it's an awkward phrase because it's translating an awkward Greek phrase. And it's an awkward Greek phrase because it's the translation of the Hebrew phrase that God uses when he tells Moses his name. When he says, I am who I am. Go to the people and tell them, I am has sent you. And so when Jesus shows up, walks on the water in the middle of the wind and the waves and says, it is I, he is saying to the disciples, I am is here. I am is with you. The God who not only rules the storm, but brings his people through it has come to you in this situation. I am this God with and for you in the middle of the chaotic sea. And that's why Peter asks, and Jesus invites him onto the water. It's because Jesus is the God who not only rules the storm, but who brings his people through it. Jesus brings the stable revelation of the mountain to the chaotic situation of the sea. And how do the disciples experience this revelation? How do they come to know Jesus in this profound way as the God who not only rules over the storm but brings his people through it? How do they come to know him in that way? It's by being afraid. They know Jesus not after their fear but in their fear. It is so important for us to recognize that the command, do not be afraid, comes after the revelation and action of Jesus. And that is important for two reasons. It's important, first of all, because often we hear the the command, do not be afraid, we extract it from its context and we read it the wrong way around. We read it as if Jesus is saying, if you get yourself together, if you'll stop being so ridiculous, if you'll stop worrying so much, then I will intervene, I will help, I will show up, I will love you. But that is the exact opposite of what happens in this story, isn't it? To whom does Jesus show up and reveal himself as I am? To whom does Jesus show up and reveal himself as the God of that story? It's the afraid. It's the worried. It is the terrified. Jesus reveals himself not after their fear, but in their fear. And yes, Peter hears the correcting voice of Jesus, but when does he hear it? It's after he has felt the rescuing grip of Jesus. Jesus doesn't stand back and wait for Peter to stop worrying before he rescues him. No, he rescues him in his worry, in his anxiety. Often this text is applied as, don't be like the disciples. 
but don't you want to come to know Jesus in the way that the disciples did? And I, I emphasize that because many of us hear that command, do not be afraid, and we feel ashamed. We feel deep guilt and shame about our struggle with anxiety. We feel guilt and shame about our need for help, for counseling or other medical care in our struggle with anxiety. But I want you to see that Jesus loves to reveal himself. He loves to show up for people who are struggling with anxiety. And he doesn't stand back and wait for you to stop worrying. No, he reaches out for people who are struggling to see anything but the waves. Second reason, it's important for us to see that the command follows from the revelation and action of Jesus. That helps us to realize that this command is less about emotion and more about attention. It's less about what we're feeling and more about what we do with those feelings, or better, what Jesus does with those feelings. Do not fear is not the demand for emotional perfection. No, it is Jesus inviting us to a persistent attentiveness to his presence with us in our struggle with fear. In the wind and the waves. Jesus is not saying, stop it. Stop feeling that way. He is saying, when you feel that way, look at me. See my presence. See my love. See my work. Hear my promises. For Father's Day, my family gave me a pair of, of earphones and these earphones have noise-canceling technology with them, which I was laughing and teasing them a little bit. It's a little ironic that they gave me a gift that enables me more effectively to tune them out. But I'm trying not to use the gift that way. But, but it, it is incredible. You put these earphones on, and you hear some sounds go back, and you hear other sounds come forward. And that's what Jesus gives us when he says, do not be afraid. He wants to take some sounds and move them back. And then he wants to take the sound of him, him saying, it is I, and bring it to the forward. Bring it to the front of our minds and our hearts that when we feel the panic rise, we look to him. We hear from him. Jesus, when he says, do not be afraid, he is bringing the mountain of his presence to the chaotic sea of our situation. And the question is, can you see him? Can you hear him? When he says, do not be afraid, he wants, to know, he wants us to know that the one who is with us in the storm is the one who not only walked on the water, but sank underneath the flood of our sin on the cross so that he can reach out his hand to anxious people like Peter, like you, like me, and lift us up and lead us to eternal solid ground. Let's pray. Father, we need your help. You know our frame. You know that we are weak, we are fragile, and you know that we're afraid. And you know that we often hear your command, do not be afraid, as a condemnation. Would you help us to know that it is not that? 
That in Jesus there is no condemnation. So that in Jesus, as we hear you saying, do not be afraid, we can hear it as an invitation to know that you are with us. When we are afraid. That you are calling us to know the stable mountain of who you are for us in Jesus. Even in the instability of our lives and our world. Father, would you bring the sound of Jesus saying, it is I, to the foreground of our lives. Would you help us to know his gracious reach towards us? when it seems like all we see is the waves? Would you help us to know his compassionate call to us to look to him, to hear from him, and know that he is the God who not only rules over the storm, but who will bring us through the storm into your promises and the solid ground. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.